Do you know how many stories we have of people that were run over by tanks? Do you know how many stories we have of people that were woke at night, thrown out of their homes, and then made to watch in the cold as their homes were destroyed? How many stories we have of when the apartheid wall was constructed, how it ran right through our land in Tulkarum, in the West Bank? You know how many stories every single Palestinian has? You need to ask questions. You need to ask, where did this all come from? Or you're going to keep repeating the same bigoted tropes that those angry Muslims and Arabs just woke up again and decided to cause trouble. We're not going to wait for you to find your moral compass for us to insist on our existence and to insist on our liberation. Welcome to The Big Picture, a show about the past, the present, and the future. My name is Mohammed Hassan, and today we sit down with Muslim American scholar, civil rights advocate, and writer, Dr. Omar Suleiman. Dr. Suleiman is the president of Yaqeen Institute, a Texas-based Islamic think tank and an adjunct professor of Islamic studies at Southern Methodist University. His presence is felt not only in Muslim communities, but the wider United States, where he's been on the front lines of protests against police brutality, anti-immigration policies, and political prisoners. In 2018, he was arrested alongside Muslim and Jewish activists at the Capitol Hill in Washington where they were demonstrating against the detention of migrant children at the U.S.-Mexico border. Over the last few months, he's been one of the loudest religious voices speaking about the war in Gaza. He himself, a child of Palestinian refugees, and has used his platform to criticize his own government's role in arming and supporting Israel. So as an activist, how does he see his role in this difficult moment? And as a religious leader, how does he explain what it means? Suleiman, it's an absolute pleasure having you with us today. Welcome to The Big Picture. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I want to talk to you about the current moment that we're living in right now, uh, in the last three months of the Gaza war, of the global movement that has erupted as a result of it, and what it means for people, what it means for yourself as a, a Muslim, as a community leader, as a Palestinian. How do you understand what is happening? Well, I think that there is a massive atrocity that is playing out on people's screens that is also exposing a massive crime against humanity that has been hidden from people's screens for all of this time. Mm -hmm. So for many people, this is their first real exposure to the oppression of the Palestinian people. This is their first real exposure to the occupation and apartheid that predates this latest episode. And so for, for many people, they're getting exposed to it for the first time. And even if you've been exposed to it before and you were already you know, emotionally vested in some capacity, the way that this is unfolding, the brutality of it all, is particularly you know, outrageous and evokes another level of empathy from those that already felt a deep connection to well, you know, the Palestinian cause. Mm -hmm. And I think a new layer of activism. This is turning the page, not just on Israel's dominance of the narrative around the world, but this is also for many people their moment to sort of come into their activism and to really become involved in something greater than themselves. And I think that for many people, the Palestinian cause represents something so much greater than any other individual cause that they may have been vested in before for the Palestinian people and beyond, right? This is, this is a moment in history where we have an opportunity to really undo this great injustice once and for all. And you're absolutely right about there being this level of awareness that is almost unprecedented historically. I don't think there has been a time in the past where we have had this level of access to something that is happening on the ground at a minute-by-minute -minute basis, sometimes on live television, sometimes live on social media. And you've seen the reaction in a lot of people. You've seen it in young people, particularly, who are uh, experiencing something that is quite traumatic, um, horrific, and difficult to understand. What do you think is significant about this happening at this particular time with our level of access um, and the level of access that people in Gaza have 
to be able to tell their story? Well, I think that what's happening is that you're actually getting a human connection to people on the ground. How many people now know Walid Dahdouh, mm. right? I mean, he's been on Al Jazeera for how many years now? Yeah. He's been on TV for how many years? Trying to tell the story of his people. Now, unfortunately, that has come at great cost, personal cost to him. So many journalists that have either lost their lives or their families have been directly targeted by the Israeli occupation regime to silence them, to intimidate them. But how many people know Walid Dahdouh now? How many people have connected to the stories of people like Ruh al Ruh, Am uh, Khalid, as they call him, the grandfather who lost the soul of his soul, his granddaughter Reem? How many people have had a human connection to that person? So, on the one hand, the humanization of the Palestinian people, especially the people in Gaza, is starting to shine through and in the process unravel much of the destructive narrative that they have been shrouded in for decades now, on the one hand. On the other hand, how many more dead children do people need to see before they can finally wake up and not just express outrage, but actually directly participate in the actions around the world mm -hmm. to try to halt this atrocity. How many more dead children do you need to see? So it's, it's interesting because you do have this conundrum, right, on behalf of the Palestinian people that are there, the Palestinian diaspora, and those that have been committed to the cause. It's like, how much more do we need to audition for your empathy? Mm -hmm. How much more before the excuses that have been given to justify the suppression no longer are acceptable to you. And then, you know, how do we convey sufficiently, right? That, look, this isn't just one, this isn't just a genocide that's happening now. This has been a genocide. This has been a project of ethnic cleansing, a project of genocide that's been unfolding. We're just seeing the worst escalation of it. Mm. But we're not just looking for a ceasefire. It's about time that everybody takes personal responsibility. And wherever you are, you have something to do with this, whether you like it or not. Your government is somewhat involved in this, whether you like it or not. In the case of the United States, we're in the belly of the beast and we're watching our brothers and sisters in its fangs. Mm -hmm. And so we have to remove as much as we can, right? The, uh, if anything, just the, the firepower that's being supplied uh, to Israel to carry out this atrocity with our tax dollars. If anything, wake up the consciousness of the next generation of young Americans so that they will not allow this to continue. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a place where your country is a silent observer, if you're in a place where your country has economic ties to Israel, you have to put up enough pressure through your collective efforts to try to hold Israel accountable in whatever way that you possibly can. So everyone has to take a sense of personal responsibility right now because wherever you are in whatever part of the world, you can directly affect this, this conflict. I, I hate using the word conflict, mm. this occupation. You can directly impact the lives of the Palestinian people by combating the lies of Israel and making sure that your government in whatever capacity is holding Israel accountable. You've been somebody that has not shied away from being very vocal um, politically as well. And over the last few months, you have criticized uh, your own government quite extensively over its role in arming Israel, as, as you've mentioned, but the political support that, uh, that Israel um, enjoys from uh, the United States, regardless of administration. Was that, you know, when, when you know, we don't want to use the word conflict, but when this war first began, did you think about what your role would be in this in this moment in time? Was were you compelled to speak out, uh, to criticize, to be a a vocal political voice? Was it something that you thought about and decided to do intentionally? I mean, this is something that's deeply personal, obviously, and I don't want to, you know, minimize that. This is personal, right? This is family. This is this is at the end of the day a genocide against my own flesh and blood, mm. against my own relatives, against people that look like me, against people that 
army. And the only reason why I'm in the United States is because my parents were victims of this occupation in the first place. And so when people say, go back home in America, I'm like, you do realize what you're saying, right? So um, are you going to give us the right to return or not? Mm. Um, so it's deeply personal. Uh, when it comes to the United States, look, I've spoken about the United States government's role in erasing its victims constantly in its dirty wars. The tactics that were used in the Iraq war are the same tactics that are being used right now to erase the victims of that war. So I've spoken about this, and I've spoken about how this has transcended party. This has been through, you know, uh, throughout the years under Democratic and Republican administrations. At the end of the day, it's just whether or not those administrations are going to offer empty symbolic statements of condemnation towards Israel's actions or not. But at the end of the day, America has, the United States of America has constantly provided cover, provided weaponry, provided international uh, immunity to Israel's crimes. And so, you know, I, I go back and I often think about this. I remember uh, it, it was probably eight, nine years ago um, where the United States was condemning Israel's settlement expansions, but at the same time making sure that it vetoes any resolution in the United Nations to condemn Israel. Mm. And I think John Kerry at the time said, Israel can't be both Jewish and democratic. It's going to have to choose one. The yeah. twilight of the Obama administration. That, that's ex yeah. yeah, and that's the Biden administration is a little bit more bolder and it's open uh, uh, pro-Israel rhetoric, right? Mm. But at the end of the day, it's been the same thing. Right, so offer the statements, you know, and you'll see that slap on the wrist. I don't even want to call it that from Anthony Blinken, but at the same time, you know, making sure that Israel's not held accountable, and making sure that we continue to fund it mm -hmm. while it carries out these crimes. So, it has been in many situations a choice between a government that openly says what it's doing or contradicts what it's doing. But at the end of the day, what it is doing is criminal. Mm -hmm. It is funding genocide. It is partaking in genocide against our people. So I've tried to be consistent in criticizing all administrations in this regard. I do think Joe Biden is probably the most uh, Zionist Democratic president. And that's... You know, but by his own words. By his own words, yeah. right, that we've ever had. Um, you know, and people say... Um, you know, but he, at least he's better than Trump. Mm. You know, at least he's he's not going to do this. He's not going to do that. You know, look, he's launching these Islamophobia uh, commissions and he's talking about, you know, being welcoming to Muslims and Palestinians in the United States. I look at them with this with this sense of just complete disillusionment. Like, do you realize what this man is doing? Mm. Do you realize that this is potentially the greatest evil we have seen in a very long time, right? Or not even potentially, this is the greatest evil we've seen in a very long time. And he is the main, the main party to it because Israel could not do any of this without the United States. And so it's, it's sort of like, you know, at the end of the day, allowing for the masks to fall and the masks have fallen from supposed allies and uh, as well as outright enemies. It's just made them uglier, right? And it's made supposed allies ugly as well to many people that may have seen them as allies. But at the end of the day, this gives us, I think, an opportunity to allow Americans to interrogate the way that America does business in the world, period. Like this is waking people up, I think, young people in particular, to the ugliness of America's foreign policy to the way that it conducts itself in the world. Israel being the most obvious example of that ugliness. It's always funny to me when people talk about, you know, the United States is losing uh, the Arab street. The United States is losing its international credibility. The United States lost its international credibility a long time ago. But if there was anything left in that account, it's gone now. Mm -hmm. No one takes the United States seriously, and for good reason. And so, if anything, you know, the president of the United States should never be able to pontificate to the world again about, 
you know, human rights and democracy and uh, freedom when it is the greatest party to the oppression of the Palestinian people and so many more with that same dehumanizing policy and corrupt way of existing in the, uh, in the global sphere uh, today. So it's important for us, I think, to be consistent in, in holding all administrations accountable and saying this isn't Democratic or Republican. Unfortunately, this is the way America has been. This is America, right? This is America. And there are many issues where, you know, we've been forced to actually hold up that mirror and say this is America. When it comes to the role of the United States government in the global arena, this is America. You know what America is? It's a bunch of dead kids dismembered with the worst of weapons with absolutely no accountability and making sure that you don't hear the stories of its victims. Mm -hmm. This is America. Gaza is America. This is what American atrocity looks like. This is what this is what our tax dollars go to. While we're seeing this rise in homelessness and poverty and desperation in the United States where you have a growing disparity, right, across classes. This is what America is spending its money on. This is what the government's concerning itself with. Making sure that it continues to put American tax dollars in the accounts of weapons manufacturers while supplying the worst genocide that we've seen in our lifetime. Mm. And you're somebody that would have grown up in a United States altered by the September 11 attacks, the war on terror, and for a long time criticizing U.S. foreign policy the way that you are, criticizing its relationship to Israel, um, there wasn't a lot of space to be able to do that without a, quite a considerable backlash to yourself in the public eye, um, to your uh, ability to be able to navigate through your life as a citizen. Um, and I mean, even just recently, you know, you've the things that you've you've said uh, that were critical of Israel have been criticized. The, Texas Senator Ted Cruz called you an anti-Semitic cleric, uh, which, you know, very similar to the, the, the way that other people have been criticized that they speak out um, against the U.S.'s relationship with Israel. What does it mean for you to be able to criticize the United States as fiercely as you are, you're doing now, and what are the consequences of it? I mean, it's a badge of honor when someone like Ted Cruz calls you an anti-Semite <laughs> or calls you anything, right? I mean, it's he's one of those guys that you want to make sure is on the other side of you, or else you have to question your <laughs> you have to question your existence. Um, if Ted Cruz is happy with you, that probably means you're doing something wrong. <laughs> so uh, you have to check I'm, yourself. Yeah, I'm, I'm. You know, w you know, he can he can continue to uh, operate as he always has. You know, distant from the people. Mm. Uh, when Dallas was under a winter storm. This is a true story, actually. When Dallas was under um, a winter storm, they called it the winter Armageddon because we had just the worst, uh, you know, snowstorm in the history of Dallas and we weren't equipped at all. It was Muslims, it was my community, not me, my community, the Muslim community, mm -hmm. right, that rose to the occasion and that made sure that every single shelter in Dallas had proper supplies, provided all three meals for all of them. And you know what the beauty was? It was primarily Syrian refugees mm -hmm. that we were commissioning to cook the food for the homeless in Dallas' shelters and those that were having to be put into those shelters because of the winter storm. You know where Ted Cruz was? Cancun, Mexico, mm -hmm. right? So uh, when he's on the other side, I'm happy. Yep. You know, that, that means I'm doing something right. Um, so I don't take him seriously and I don't take other um, you know, Islamophobes seriously and people that um, have operated within just this, this sewer of uh, corrupt politics. But I think what it means to critique America uh, fiercely and to critique the United States government fiercely um, and what the consequences of that are um, is to first and foremost speak as someone who is actually vested in the welfare of people. And that's something as a Muslim, I want good for people. I want good for my neighbors. I actually do care about the people around me. I care about the future of young Americans who don't know what their country has been doing mm -hmm. in the world around them. Um, so I speak fully as a Palestinian and I speak fully as an American in that 
I will critique and hold my government accountable because I pay taxes. I live in that country, right? And a lot of my neighbors have no idea what's going on and the way that America conducts itself because they have been told for so many years that people that look like me are an inherent threat and that Muslims abroad and, and Arabs and Muslims, it's all the same thing to most Americans, right? Muslims abroad, Arabs and Muslims abroad and Arabs and Muslims domestically have this propensity to violence, this unique propensity to violence that they cannot but be governed by brutality wherever they are. And so we have to bomb them or surveil them. Mm -hmm. We have to silence them. We have to uh, mitigate the threat that they pose to us because we will cease to exist if we let Muslims and Arabs exist, and particularly Palestinians, right, um, that are uniquely looked at as violent, um, you know, by Americans. So it's important for me then to speak to people around me, to speak to other Americans, and to say, is this really what you want your money going to? Is this really the way that you think a just nation conducts itself? in a collapsing world? Is this really the route that you want to see this country take? Is this really the trajectory that you're comfortable with for your own children and future generations to come? And are you ready to be critical of the fundamental lies that you've been fed your entire life about how the United States exists in the world? Mm -hmm. Are you ready to be critical of that policy? Are you ready to see through those framings? and interrogate them. And by and large, I'm starting to find that young people are saying, yeah, absolutely. They're not hostage mm -hmm. to legacy media outlets. They're not hostage to what CNN tells them, to what Fox News tells them, to what whatever outlet it is tells them. They're not hostage to these anymore. They're looking for alternative news sources. They're looking for Middle East Eye. They're watching Al Jazeera. They're watching you know, all sorts of uh, you know, news outlets outside of the United States. And this is not just true for Americans, right? This is also just true for, for Gen Zers in general that are accessing the world through social media, which poses its own set of problems. But the point is, is that you have people that are willing to be more critical of the fundamental lies that they've been told growing up. So I think, you know, there's an important opportunity for us to not just make sure that we get it right on Palestine, but that we help America stop getting it so wrong all the time mm. in how it functions with the world around it. Sometimes you're going to uh, have to show your dedication to um, just the welfare of people around you. And that is something that's important to us, especially as Muslims, to care for your neighbor, right? There's so much in our tradition about making sure that your neighbor doesn't go to sleep hungry while you go to sleep well fed. And there's also an element of that to say, look, I still have a connection to my ummah. I still have a connection to my people. I still have a connection to, you know, people that are being oppressed because they are me. And I'm going to make sure that you are no longer able to oppress them. Mm -hmm. uh, without accountability. So it's it's balancing, you know, these contradicting worlds, yeah. but also with a consistent framework. At the end of the day, I want good for people, right? As a Muslim, I want good for people. But that means that people have to be a little bit more critical about what the government does in their name mm -hmm. and make sure that that's no longer the case. You uh, spoke at the uh, Oxford Union earlier, well, last year now, yeah. Um, and one of the things that you said was that you felt that the Palestinian issue, the Palestinian story, was perceived by the world as this burden for a long time, and that Palestinian voices were often silenced and ignored. And it feels that now we're in a moment where those voices can no longer be ignored. Yeah. Is that how you feel? Yeah, because in War and Peace, right, the Abraham Accords was the example that I gave. You know, Israel's making peace with the Arabs. Mm -hmm basically all the Arabs except for the Palestinians, the people that are their, their primary victims, right? Um, Israel's at war with Hamas. Well, where are the Palestinians, right? Uh, so we get erased in war and in peace. Mm. The point is, is that Palestine is being erased. P 
Palestinian history is being erased. Palestinian tradition is being erased. Palestinian claims are being erased. And so the only way to fight back is to center Palestinian voices that have been affected. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's important to sort of push back and say that, look, Palestinians don't want to be your refugees. They don't want to be your uh, victims. They don't want to be your charity case. They want to exist with their full self-determination. They want to exist in their land, in their families' homes. They want to have the freedom to import and export, the freedom to move, the freedom to grow, the freedom to pursue um, higher opportunities in education. You know, wherever Palestinians go, by the way, when it comes to their education levels, they're some of the most educated people in the world. Why? Because there's an understanding that the margin of error for Palestinians is so small, mm -hmm. right? So we have to do everything that we possibly can because the weight of the world has been so heavy to try to suppress any notion of Palestinian existence. And that's been the case not just in the Western world, sadly, in many parts of the Muslim world. We're an inconvenience, right? We're an inconvenience to your normalization. We're an inconvenience to your arms deals. We're an inconvenience to all of the economic trade that you want to have with Tel Aviv. We're an inconvenience, if you're a Muslim in the West, to your political mobility. Because the moment that you say Palestine is the moment that you become an outcast in whatever political party you're in. Mm. We're an inconvenience to you. We're an inconvenience to your integration, assimilation project. We're an inconvenience every single time. And what we're saying is, we don't want to be your inconvenience. But we will speak. And we will call you out on your bankruptcy, your moral bankruptcy. And we will utilize, I think, not just our own strength as Palestinians, but the growing strength of the movement for Palestine to make sure that we hold accountable every party that has been complicit in our erasure. So uh, what, what, what I think is really important right now is that, you know, for the first time in a long time, you have a bunch of people that want to be Palestinian, <laughs> that are proud of being pro-Palestinian, that see their commitment to Palestine as a representation of everything else that they want to be, that see this moral cause in front of them. And uh, I think it's going to be too costly to ignore Palestine going forward. So I'm encouraged by that. I've never seen more people in my life saying free Palestine. But at the same time, the future of Gaza has never been so bleak, right? So it's like we're in this contradiction, again, between hope and helplessness, you know, uh, dedication and despair, mm. being inspired by the people of Gaza and being worried about the people of Gaza, thinking about what comes next while also trying to make sure people don't, you know, fatigue and don't tune out of the moment. So it's a lot of this happening right now. And also trying to, again, walk it back. I tell people all the time, if you were comfortable with the status quo in September of 2023, then that's something for you to interrogate about yourself. Mm -hmm. Muslim or non-Muslim, Arab or non-Arab, why were you okay with this? You know, I talk about the Palestinian prisoners all the time, you know, what about our hostages? Mm -hmm. right? So why were you okay with occupation and apartheid as the status quo? Why were you okay with settlement expansion? Why were you okay with the normalization that has been taking place between Israel and multiple Muslim and Arab nations at the great loss of the Palestinian people because of the disappearance of their cause. Why were you okay with all this? Why weren't you protesting in September? Why weren't we? Let me hold myself accountable. Why weren't we doing a better job mm. to make sure that this cause was front and center before Gaza, before the genocide escalated to the point that it has now? I think that's a really uh, astute point because if you look at what's Gaza has been over the last 20 years and, and the response from the world every time there is a uh, a war in Gaza, every time Gaza is bombed, there is outrage and there is protests and there is uh, slogans and then things calm down and, and people move on, people forget. Do you feel like 
the rest of the world, even those who are deeply sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, have a kind of responsibility to to, to reflect on their own um, willingness to carry on with their lives and, and just kind of have Gaza and the Palestinian issue as this thing that we care about once every four years, but then otherwise probably don't think about? That would be the greatest tragedy out of all of this, is if the world moves on prematurely. That would be the greatest tragedy. Let me tell you, the people of Gaza are already talking about how they're going to go and pitch their tents and live in the same place that was destroyed, where their family members might even still be under the rubble and rebuilt in Gaza because the people of Gaza are resilient. Will we be resilient for them? Mm. Are we just satisfied with a ceasefire? Are we going to talk about the core issues here of apartheid and occupation? The clear intentions of Benjamin Netanyahu to carry out a full ethnic cleansing project of the Palestinian people. Are we going to talk about this? Are we going to continue to tune in? Or are we going to go on with our lives until the next tragedy unfolds? Mm -hmm. It is a tragedy. It has been a tragedy. I remember in 2021, the New York Times published that photo uh, of, I believe it was 55 Palestinian children at the time that were killed in Israel's bombardment then. And of course, the Zionist lobby panicked even then because God forbid people see Palestinian children as human beings. And the New York Times, which has historically uh, not been um, a great outlet to the Palestinian people, to say the least, mm. uh, putting the pictures of Palestinian children, just 55 of them, on the front cover was deeply threatening mm. to the Zionist lobby, right? I mean, it, you immediately have the words thrown, anti-Semitic, blood libel. It's just, it's the same broken record every single time that is miraculously, you know, simultaneous to the destruction of Palestinian lives, right? So our blood is shed, but we're not able to say anything about it because that would be anti-Semitic. That was 55 Palestinian children. Yeah. Can you imagine if the world heard the stories of 10,000 Palestinian children? I'm just talking about the children because, you know, every civilian life is a story. And then everyone whose life is connected to that life is destroyed by extension. There are people who are not in the casualty count that have lost every single person that is beloved to them mm -hmm. and some limbs in the process as well that are going to have to supposedly move on and figure out life after this with absolutely no documentation mm -hmm. of their trauma as far as the world is concerned. So people in Gaza know they're human. And they know that they have to exist, and they know that they have to persist, and they know that they have to be steadfast. But what we have to do is make sure that the stories of tragedy in the moment, and even after this is all over, that those stories are not lost, and that those stories have the potency to make sure that it never gets to that again. Never again, right? Never again for anyone. Mm -hmm. And that we actually undo the historic oppression that's there. So once this is all over, we're going to have to make sure that the story of every single person that was killed and every single person whose life was destroyed is sufficiently told and then sufficiently given value and then becomes the fuel for a consistent Palestine freedom movement mm. until it's all free. So that's where I think it's going to be important for all of us to sort of step in and say, all right, look, social media stopped the images of dead children from showing up on your screen. They have suppressed multiple uh, pro-Palestine accounts. They've made sure that you're only getting a window into the broader picture of what's happening to the Palestinian people. But are they going to suppress the pictures and the stories of smiling Palestinian children before they were killed, men and women before they were killed, the hopes, the dreams, the journals, the wedding albums, the, uh, the children's pictures in school, are they going to suppress all of that? What we have to do is we have to make sure that their stories are not forgotten and that their stories are used to make sure that there aren't more like them another four years from now, two years from now, or whatever it may be, when the next bombardment comes and the next you know, episode of this genocide 
unfolds. And honestly, look, the stories of Palestinian prisoners, uh, it's amazing to me that so many people can be so hypocritical and use hashtags like bring them all home and talk about Israeli hostages without asking themselves why there were so many Palestinian children in Israeli detention facilities in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Are they not hostages too? Are they not hostages too? 5,000 mm. Palestinians arbitrarily detained in military Israel courts, uh, Israeli military courts, all of these years. Where are you? You know, you feign this moral outrage about Israeli hostages and talk about how their stories matter and shed tears over the separations of families. Aren't all families alike? Aren't you saying that every human life is alike? When you have an occupation that can subject over 3 million Palestinians in the West Bank to routine night raids and pick up a bunch of children and throw them into military courts, not, not civil courts, mm military courts whenever they feel like and then use them as bargaining pieces mm. are they not hostages to subject them to interrogation solitary confinement with absolutely no international accountability yeah. are they not hostages to and i'll tell you it was um you know it was really interesting to see how quickly the house resolution passed um you know the pro-israel house resolution passed when uh hr 2950 i believe has been on the floor now for years, which is supposed to prohibit or at least condition aid to Israel on the basis of the detention of Palestinian children, mm -hmm. the Betty McCollum uh, bill. I worked on the late Congresswoman uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson in Texas. She had signed on to that bill, but it was only like 14 Congress uh, uh, Congress people that were willing to sign on to that bill. 14. Mm -hmm. With something so easily... Um, you know, detectable to the human conscience and to the American mindset mm. that Palestinian children should not be detained in military courts and that the United States should not fund the detention of Palestinian children. Where were your bring them all home hashtags then? Where was your outrage over Palestinian hostages? Why are you not asking questions about apartheid and occupation? Two systems, right? the Israeli civil system and the military system mm. that millions of stateless people are subjected to. It has an over 95% conviction rate as well. And whenever they feel like it, I think they detained more Palestinian children or, or took in more hostages. I'm going to call them hostages because they're not prisoners because they committed no crime. Took in more Palestinian hostages mm. during the truce than they released. So... What are we? We're just, we're just your bargaining chips. We're just isn't that the outrage? Isn't that you know in and of itself indicative to you of a systemic problem? Are you not paying attention? This is not a group that just went in and grabbed a bunch of Palestinians because they succeeded in you know breaking through some sort of wall or you know uh, launching a raid on you know, an innocent, unsuspecting group of Palestinian people. This is a supposed democracy, a supposed country that holds millions of people hostage to an apartheid system. And the country that has been enabling it and that has made sure that it is never held accountable for it is the United States of America. Mm. Why aren't you asking questions? You know what I tell people about Palestinian children and detention? The reaction is always this, really? No one says, what did they do? Mm. Because a normal, decent human being is going to say, children should not be picked up in night raids and disappear from their families without having their parents present with them in courts. And their parents find them 20, 30 years later with all sorts of torture inflicted on them, that children shouldn't be subjected to that. What did they, no one says, what did they do? Because we have international laws that somehow Israel always escapes. Why? Because of the United States government, solely the United States government that makes sure that any measure of accountability that could possibly be leveraged to stop this atrocity is blocked every single time while issuing these empty statements of, of condemnation for this expansion of the ethnic cleansing project of, of, of Israel.
The issue of Palestinian prisoners is, is particularly important because you're absolutely right in saying that it doesn't get the attention that it deserves. Uh, Let's just call them hostages. Well, hostages. Palestinian hostages. I, I'm going to stop using the word Palestinian prisoners. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're not prisoners. They didn't do anything wrong. Children are not prisoners. Mm. They're hostages mm. to an illegal occupation regime. Mm. I think we've become uh, accustomed to pictures of Israeli hostages. Um, people are putting them up uh, on lampposts and in, in, in streets and pictures of, of people, civilians that that are uh, being held. And this campaign that you mentioned to try and release those hostages uh, reminds me quite a lot. The visual imagery of it reminds me a lot of what every Palestinian village looks like in the West Bank, where you have walls plastered with hundreds of images of people, often young people, um, that have been in detention um, for weeks, months, sometimes years. And that this being an issue that touches almost every Palestinian family that has someone in their family that is in detention. I don't know a single Palestinian family in the world that doesn't have someone in detention, Mm -hmm. someone that has been subjected to it, not one. So look, we're, and, and I'm a Muslim, and I speak to people obviously from a spiritual framework, but sometimes you just have to speak to their just human decency. If you're indifferent to suffering, you know, the same emotion that would move you to hear the story of an Israeli hostage and to see the images of a family that was together then torn apart, where have those emotions been? Either you're not seeing it or you don't want to see it or you've been purposely ignoring it or you've, even worse, been purposely erasing it. But you just can't tell me anymore with the amount of suffering, Palestinian suffering, that has been widely covered, that you haven't seen it. Mm. The President of the United States hasn't seen it, supposedly. He's never you know, paid any serious attention to it, or at least any serious heed to it, and, and even his public statements. But how can you not ask these basic questions anymore? and still feign moral outrage about hostages. We are hostages. Three million people in the West Bank are hostages to an occupation, to apartheid. 2.2 million people in Gaza have been hostages. They don't have any basic rights. Mm -hmm. You can pick them up arbitrarily, subject them to all sorts of torture, and No one can do anything about it because the United States government has blocked any potential uh, legal recourse in the international arena. Where's your outrage? And so you have to imagine it's exhausting. As a Palestinian American, I mean, I'm telling you, like, when people ask me, like, how are you feeling? How have you been? It's exhausting to have to sit with someone and try to convince them Mm -hmm. that you're human, that you have a legacy of oppression that has run through your family. You know how many stories of, and and I'm I'm gonna be very blunt here, you know how many stories of sexual violence we have in my own family? Sexual violence at the hands of Israeli soldiers, of IDF soldiers. Do you know how many stories we have of people that were run over by tanks? Do you know how many stories we have of people that were awoke at night, thrown out of their homes? and then made to watch in the cold as their homes were destroyed. How many stories we have of when the apartheid wall was constructed, how it ran right through our land in Tulkarum, in the West Bank. You know how many stories every single Palestinian has? At this point, I don't have to tell you my story anymore. You need to ask questions. You need to ask questions. You need to ask where did this all come from? Or you're going to keep repeating the same bigoted tropes that those angry Muslims and Arabs just woke up again and decided to cause trouble. You've got to ask questions at this point. Mm -hmm. And we're not going to wait for you to find your moral compass for us to insist on our existence and to insist on our liberation. I think that's where every Palestinian is at right now. We're tired. We're like, you know what? We're not going to wait anymore. We're not going to wait for public opinion in the United States to change. It is shifting, but I'm not going to wait for public opinion to change to start holding the government accountable. Mm -hmm. I believe, let me tell you this by the way, I think 10, 15 years from now, if not sooner, politicians will be speaking to this overwhelming shift 
in American public opinion. And many of the same people that are either silent or active in propelling this genocide today will deny all complicity. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was there and I remember when I was in, in Congress and I was talking to people, I was talking to my colleagues behind the scenes and I was telling them, you know, this is wrong and we have to condition military aid. We have to stop arming this genocide and we have to be more balanced about this. You're going to hear these in 10 years. You're I mean, hear I mean you're, you're hearing similar things with the, the Iraq war, for example. Right. Yeah, yeah. You, you're so many politicians that are backtracking on statements they made earlier in support of the war and, and pretending that they were on the, the right side of history yeah. back then. So you think this will happen again? Yeah, and I don't want your delayed condolences. I'm not interested in witnessing your uh, hypocritical gymnastics at that point. Mm. I don't want your symbols at that point. You know, I think that what Israel probably wants is to wipe out the Palestinian people altogether and wipe out anything that's meaningful about Palestine and then fine. Maybe we'll put it in our textbooks at that point, the great wrong that was done to the Palestinian people, the way that the United States pays heed to the Native Americans mm -hmm. that it massacred and the slaves that it brought over to build upon its massacre. And of course, another, you know, great oppression that was committed and continues to, you know, uh, continues to manifest itself in multiple ways. Uh, the way that Canada speaks about the indigenous or the aboriginals in, in Australia, I mean, mm -hmm. we're not interested in your symb symbolic apologies later on. I don't care if you name a street after my great grandfather, after you've already wiped out any remnant of his descendants. Uh, I wanna make sure that that home stays. I wanna make sure that my place remains there, that my people can live in freedom, that our people can continue to live in freedom. I'm just, you know, I want everyone to at least appreciate, if you're a Palestinian right now in the West Bank, you're watching this unfold. Not only are you deeply distraught over what's happening, because everyone in the West Bank is somehow gonna be related to someone in, in Gaza as well. I mean, it's 60% refugee population, mm -hmm. right? So every one of us has relatives in Gaza in some way, right? But you're watching this and you're listening to the genocidal rhetoric, not just of the Israeli right-wing government. No, this is an Israel problem across all layers, unfortunately. With the exception of a tiny minority, there is a vengeance. There is a, there is a clear you know, tone that's being set across the political spectrum and within even Israeli pop culture right now, that it's time to remove the Palestinian people altogether, that let's carry this out and take it to its end. If you're a Palestinian in the West Bank that's watching it, you're thinking, all right, we're next. We're next. And the settlers are becoming more emboldened. They have been more emboldened. And I think at this point, you know, it's important for us to not wait to show people the whole picture again and to say, look, while we're all focused on Gaza for good reason, because the crimes against those people in Gaza are unprecedented. I mean, the crimes against these people are incredibly brutal and just offensive to basic moral conscience. Hey, don't forget the rest of this picture. Don't forget. I think over 400 people have already been killed in the West Bank. Mm. Don't forget the restrictions on Jerusalem, the expanding aggression on people in Jerusalem, the disappearance of Muslim claims, the disappearance of Palestinian existence there. Don't forget, because we know where they're going next. They're already talking about it. Mm. So we can't, again, we can't relinquish Gaza, but we also cannot view Gaza in isolation of the broader uh, picture and the oppression of Palestinian people as a whole. I want to ask you a question about anger, which I can sense in your voice as you're speaking, which is I think is really refreshing to hear. And you won't remember this, but we met very briefly a couple of years ago in Christchurch in New Zealand. Oh wow! The week of the uh, the Christchurch mosque shootings, and. That is a moment that I've been thinking about recently because it was a moment where, like now, it felt like the whole world was watching this singular focal point and feeling a mix of collective grief um, mm -hmm. and uh, sadness and anger. And it was the anger that um, 
I particularly felt as a New Zealander, as somebody from that community. And but it was a it was a feeling that we didn't feel like we could express. We as Muslims, having grown up in the war on terror and uh, been used to the idea of policing our own emotions publicly, the idea of anger has always been something that we are characterized with as Muslims, as Palestinians in your case, um, but something that we are we find very difficult to find avenues for. And so I wonder what you think about that, about the use of anger, the positive use of anger, the constructive use of it, and and how, I mean, not just Muslims, but how the Palestinians in this moment can use that anger to do something that is productive, that is constructive. Where where do you take this emotion? And you just opened up a whole can with New Zealand, with Christchurch. That was by far the most difficult um, few days I think I've ever experienced um, being in that place. Like 50 people, one by one, we're in an open field, the next body, the next body, the next body. Every time a body's brought forward, another family cries. You didn't even have to ask whose relative it was. Mm -hmm. You just heard the shriek mm -hmm. from that particular part of the crowd. Um, I'm going to share something, which which is it's really interesting you bring up anger. Um, I remember being with the imams and we were talking about sort of the press conference and some of the Muslim organizations. And I specifically remember a conversation about how, you know, let's make sure that, you know, we show our peaceful side, conciliatory, talk about a moment of hope. And I remember being angry at that. <laughs> because, like you said, we get painted with this anger. And it's because of that depiction precisely that you incite these maniacs in the world, like the terrorist in New Zealand. I'm not, I'm not even willing to use his name. Mm -hmm. You incite these people because you make them think that we're just beasts. And then we're not allowed to show our anger because we would be reinforcing the image of us that caused us that devastation in the first place. That's compounded cruelty, right? Wadir, six-year-old boy, his mom, Wadir was stabbed 26 times. Mm -hmm. when, um, when the landlord came, first he attacked Wadir's mom, stabbed her multiple times. She managed to fight him off um, and head to the bathroom. Wadir came out, ran up to him, thinking that he was going to get a hug. You know what he called him? Grandpa Joe. Grandpa Joe. And the man pulls out a military knife and proceeds to stab him to death. Wadir's mom is one of the happiest people I've ever met in my life. So jolly, so just full of joy, clearly... Clearly, there weren't many moments in their family album where they weren't smiling. And despite some hard circumstances that preceded um, that murder, a uh, pretty happy mother and child. Mm -hmm. And she's concerned and everyone's concerned about, well, how do we make sure that you know, we show people a good image of Islam? a good image of the Palestinian people. That in and of itself is outrageous. Mm. It's not fair. It's not fair that you get to portray us as violent, to excuse your violence against us, and then we have to bear the weight of making sure that we don't appear violent yeah. when condemning your violence. It's craziness. So as a Muslim, because I function as a Muslim, first and foremost, before I function as a Palestinian or as an American, I function as a Muslim. One of the things we learned from the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is this concept of righteous anger. He was angry when he saw injustice. He was never angry for his own ego. He was never angry because someone insulted him. He wasn't angry because um, someone, you know, was rude to him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or treated him in a certain way. It was anger when he saw the violation 
of Allah's commands and the greatest of transgression or of the greatest of transgressions uh, would certainly be a transgression against an innocent life. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the things that we learned from him is the anger that he had when a woman from the opposing side was found dead in the battlefield. I want you to think about this. Like, he has a lot on his plate. He's lost his own family members to the oppression against him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he still had the heart to feel anger when an innocent woman was killed from the other side. That's our, that's our religion. Mm-hmm. That's, not, that's who we are. That's what we're supposed to ground ourselves in. A consistency. It's refreshing these days because it's rare. Yeah. Consistency. Right? We condemn the murder of innocent people. We condemn oppression against any people. We condemn, we condemn, we condemn. But at the same time, I'm sick of you telling me to condemn mm. while not being able to look at yourself more critically. Right? At what point do you feel the pressure to condemn? At what point do you feel the pressure to disown? At what point do you feel the pressure to stand in front of a camera and apologize to the Muslim world, apologize to the Palestinian people, apologize to all those people that have been dehumanized by your rhetoric and killed by your policy. At what point do you feel the pressure? Mm -hmm. We're sick of feeling the pressure. I'm just not willing to stand in front of a camera anymore. Say, I condemn, I condemn, and smile and put you at ease while you're giving my people hell. It's just not, it's it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. I think that that's been taken out. I don't have the appetite for that anymore, and I know that a lot of Muslims don't have the appetite for that anymore. But there is, again, something we look at the Prophet's life on them. The Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, taught us righteous anger. Yeah, one of his supplications, Allah manni as'aluka kalimat al-haqq fil rida wal ghadab. Oh Allah, I ask you for the ability to speak the truth when I'm pleased and when I'm angry. Mm. So when you're angry, you don't transgress. Your anger should come from a place of righteousness. And it is righteous to be angry over such an evil that's being committed against people. So I hated that after Christchurch. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was easy, by the way, because you know we're in the, the Trump era at that point. Everyone's talking about white nationalism and white supremacy because it's politically convenient for progressives to do so. Mm-hmm. And Muslims were a very convenient uh, token uh, at that point. So it was very easy for people to condemn white supremacy and to say, ah, another white supremacist. They didn't care about the Muslims. They cared about the fact that they could score points by calling out the white supremacist, mm. not empathizing with the Muslim community. Not to say that members of the general public um, didn't care. I think a lot of people were, were deeply um, scarred by what happened. By the way, New Zealand, the beauty of what radiated from just like society in those days and and, and Granted, I'm ignorant. That was my first time being in New Zealand. But like, there was some genuine raw emotion mm. and solidarity. But at the same time, like, where are you people when Israel carries out this massacre? Mm. I've put people to task. Look, there are people that were willing to come and stand with the Muslim community when um, white supremacists held guns in front of our masajid and said they wanted to do to us what was done in Christchurch and that have expressed condolences and expressed solidarity when Muslim ban happened, right? Same people that took to the airport, some of them are justifying the genocide right now, and it makes me sick. And I don't have the stomach for the hypocrisy anymore. Mm-hmm. And I, when, when they've reached out, uh, I mentioned when Wadir was killed, some of them reached out, I was like, look, I reject your condolences. It's too selective, it's too hypocritical, it's too obvious at this point. Mm-hmm. There's no consistency to it at all, at all. So uh, if you're not angry about what you're seeing in Gaza, you have a faith problem, you have a humanity problem. But channel that anger in productive ways. Channel it in prayer, channel it in solidarity. Do the things that will hopefully put out this fire. Um, Don't be consumed by your anger. Mm. Be driven by it. And make sure that your anger is driven by righteousness in the first place. So as a Muslim, like you constantly have to go back to your heart. Go back to what it is that's driving you in the first place. Go back to your intentions. Mm. And as a human being, I mean, just look, what's driving you? Because like I said, in New Zealand, a lot of people saw another opportunity to condemn white supremacy. Great. But take the time to learn about those 50 lives 
that were stolen as well and realize that those people looked a lot like you, had the same dreams, aspirations, um, in their makeup, of course, you know, as human beings, they looked a lot like you, hopes and dreams, community that will never be the same again. Mm -hmm. And a community that's traumatized by extension anywhere where these threats are a regular occurrence against Masajid. It's not just another time for you to express your token condemnation of white supremacy. It's, it's, it's exhausting. Yeah. And Palestinian, look, I'm telling you, the Palestinian cause, one thing I'm grateful for is that it, it actually exposes that hypocrisy so openly that we have to remember, <laughs> we have to remember the hypocrites the next time they come knocking on our door. If someone attacks my community at home and the same politician that's been justifying the massacre of my people back home mm -hmm. tries to show up and take the mic, I will be the first person to stand in front of them and say, you are not welcome to speak. Mm -hmm. You wanna go stand in the crowd, you can. Reflect on how you've been a part of this dehumanization, you can. You wanna learn, reflect, you can. But you will not have the mic in my community again and talk to me about how sorry you feel for me. It's just not gonna happen again. So the Palestinian cause exposes people yeah. um, in a way that's, that's necessary, I think, for the world to uh, exhale, <laughs> uh, for the world to actually say, okay, this is what we're at. This is emblematic mm -hmm. of global hypocrisies. And we have to make sure that we, uh, you know, root out that hypocrisy wherever it's found on either side of the political aisle or the cultural claims. We've got to root out that hypocrisy once and for all. Mm -hmm. I have a personal question I want to ask you, and I'm asking you as a way of uh, asking for myself, uh, and because I heard you speak about, uh, you know, you mentioned intentions and intentionality, and I, and I heard you speak about this recently with regards to specifically the idea of fighting for the Palestinian cause. And we live in a world where social media has been this incredible tool mm -hmm. to translate people's stories um, and to talk about the issue and, and to spread it, but also uh, as a way of, you know, it is part of part and parcel of how people grow their pre platforms online, um, how they make careers. And, uh, and I speak as a journalist who, you know, we do this podcast, we publish it online, we hope it does well. And we know people resonate with Palestinian stories right now. They don't always do, but mm -hmm. right now they do. And there is this weird thing about the way social media works in that it rewards engagement and it rewards people caring about certain things. And I want to ask you as, as a public figure, as somebody who, you know, part and parcel of what you do is having an online presence, being able to communicate with people. Um, and when it comes to the idea of intentions, how do you sift through that? How do you kind of figure out yeah. What do you have to do <laughs> to further your own, you know, platform or, or career in some instances as a, as a journalist myself? And then how do you make sure that you're, you remain sincere to what you're saying? So it's interesting you mentioned that because um, I gave a khutbah a sermon called Measuring Sincerity mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. And it's probably like the least performing khutbah in the last uh, few months, uh, which, which tells you something, right? Whereas if it was another khutbah about Israel's lies or, you know, even though we're, we're being shadow banned on YouTube right now, mm -hmm. as every, every social media outlet that, I, that I'm on, I'm being shadow banned and threatened with a ban at this point. Um, but on YouTube, we got shadow banned, clearly. But that khutbah still after the shadow ban, relative is like even lower than, than the other sermons, right? So it's like clearly like, ah, uh, people are not super interested. Mm -hmm. Many people are not super interested in asking that critical question right now. Uh, which is a problem. Um, look, as a Muslim, you question your intention every single day. You renew it every single day. And I started off that khutbah um, with um, a hadith, a narration from the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, about a shaheed, a martyr, being the first person who goes to hellfire mm -hmm. on the Day of Judgment. Why? Because... Um, God would say to him, what did you put forth? After mentioning his blessings upon him, he would say that I did this and I did that and I lost my life for your cause, for your sake. And God would say to him, 
you're lying. You only did that so that people would say, Jari, Shuja, courageous, brave. The worst thing every human being uh, would hate to be called with is, is, is cowardice, is to be called a coward, right? And people love to be called courageous and brave and, you know, generous and and selfless and all these things, right? And there's a creation of identity, I think, that's very dangerous with the activists today, the social media activists today, mm -hmm. that it becomes about you and not the cause. It becomes about your picture in the protest, not the effectiveness of the protest itself. It becomes about your words at the press conference, not the intended audience of the press conference. It becomes about your rewarded public presence, not your private commitment. Like, there's a lot there to unravel. Mm -hmm. As a Muslim, you're supposed to be questioning your intention every single day. So how do you reckon with it? I think there are a few things. I tell people this all the time, and it concerns me, by the way, the, the, um, the dichotomy and uh, the separation between worship and activism, right? Like activists are secular, uh, then you have like the, you know, focus on your worship and only God can change things, right? This is a time to inject your private worship into your public activism, not to separate them out, not to say that this is my worship and that this is not important. This is the time to inject mm -hmm. your private worship into your public activism. Um, your prayer at night is a form of protest. Your prayer at night is a form of protest. You're protesting to the Lord of the worlds who can change all things, who's in constant control. And it's also a form of spiritual nourishment and refinement, calibration, making sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Your commitment to the cause when there's absolutely nothing that is publicly rewarding about it. I always tell people that, um, you know, the difference between people that are willing to show up for a protest and a meeting, <laughs> it's stark, right? Um, not to say there aren't many pointless meetings that I've been called to even personally in the capacity of this, because everyone wants to have a meeting to talk about what we can do, but it's like, yeah. all right, the, the meeting has to be intentional. but. The point is, is that if you're not willing to be a part of the long three to five hour meetings to get something done behind the scenes that is, you know, remarkably effective and critical to uh, the movement, but you are always down to be in front of the camera or in a public protest, question yourself. And one of the greatest measures of sincerity um, is your commitment to the cause after everyone else has moved on from it. It's one of the greatest measures of sincerity. When social media moves on, when the world moves on and accepts the status quo of the Palestinian people once again, are you moving on? Or have you been awakened to a new reality? Are you going to continue to push to do things behind the scenes, to work on uh, different political actions behind the scenes, grassroots actions, media actions behind the scenes uh, to make sure that this continues to garner the momentum that is necessary to achieve our full liberation, mm -hmm. inshallah, eventually our full liberation, inshallah. So that's that's a measure of sincerity, is your commitment behind the scenes in the moment and your commitment after the moment has passed. Mm -hmm. That's a measure of sincerity. And you can't do that unless you have a daily conversation with yourself. Why am I doing what I am doing? That's what you do with your worship. That's what you do with any significant action in your life. Why am I doing what I am doing? Mm -hmm. um, and I pray that I pray that we we find that sincerity in ourselves, and that that sincerity um, bears commitment and and zeal, but also at the t at the same time that it it's always about the people and not us. Mm -hmm. This isn't about you. This isn't about you, right? It's it's this is about them, and that's just something we have to keep on conveying. Like you know, someone described many of the protests, and by the way, protests are incredibly effective. You know when they're sustained, when they're global as they are right now, and when they factor into a broader movement. But, uh, you know, someone once described, he said, many of them feel like group therapy, Yeah. right? Just go out and we scream with people that are screaming like us and about the same things. And we go home and we feel like we liberated Palestine. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, while you were at the protest, a hundred more kids died. That means go back, take your tears to the prayer mat, and cry out and re-energize and get back at it, right? So 
I don't, if, if the protest is just going to be a means of you shouting out all your energy or social media is going to be your venting space. We don't need that. Mm-hmm. We don't need that. We need committed people. We need, we need committed workers and we need to start with ourselves. So I pray that we all find that sincerity and that we can keep it going. Mm-hmm. And if I can ask you about the, uh, the political side of things, there is an election coming up in the United States next year. There is an election coming up, uh, not next year, this year now. We're, we're in 2024. Uh, it seems a, like the UK always has elections. That's like, you guys, that's, you're, you're, that is not <laughs> Things unfair. change so much here that it's, who's the prime minister again? Like, is that sort of, that's where we're at. Exactly. You know? There's been a lot in the yeah. last couple of years. Yeah. Um, but there is a, a general election this year. Um, yeah. And there are people here in this country that are talking about what the Muslim vote looks like. And especially when there's a feeling that uh, the two major parties here, as similar to the two major parties in the United States, aren't offering any kind of um, solutions that Muslims, that Palestinians feel are are viable. And, uh, you know, you've spoken about uh, some of the Republican senators, at least one of them, but certainly the president, Joe Biden, and and there's been a lot of anger. There's been a deep sense of anger. What does that look like going into an election? And what do Muslims do about it? Is there, is there a kind of strategy in place? Yeah, it's, it's multi-pronged. So for one, um, you know, we have to show our political teeth. We have to show that our vote cannot be taken for granted. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes I think political power is demonstrated in penalizing uh, candidates and penalizing politicians for their disregard of your community. And so I sincerely hope that all of those politicians that used to take the Muslim vote for granted deeply regret it uh, from the living rooms of their homes after they have lost because they lost the Muslim vote. I sincerely hope that is the case. Um, Muslims have to have their own platforms and then they have to hold politicians accountable to those platforms. You want our vote? These are our priorities. We're going to hold you to a set of our priorities And then we're going to make the best decision that we think um, is is for our community and, of course, for our country as a whole. Again, like the the priorities are not specific to us. Uh, We prioritize the welfare of people as well. That's, That's the consistency we have to have. But we're going to hold you to this set of our priorities. And whoever checks the most boxes is going to get our vote. And uh, whoever doesn't can show up to the masjid as many times as they want and give us these empty statements and all the photo ops, but you're not getting our vote. So we've got to be able to vote as a block and we've got to have a platform and we've got to penalize and then also uh, show the, the value of our vote in regards to candidates that actually do speak to our priorities. So it's, it's, about, it's about speaking in our own voice, making sure that we're heard, and making sure that we have a political uh, path, a viable political path to being effective. I think we're getting there. Um, we're maturing, I hope, as a community. I can tell you that you know a lot of people will just point to the ugliness that has come from the Republican side in the United States. Like, we're not stupid. Uh, I hear Donald Trump. I know who Donald Trump is. I hear Nikki Haley. I hear DeSantis, right, that are in a competition uh, to see who could spew the most racist garbage. I hear them. You know, they're there. That noise exists. Mm -hmm. We we see the way that Republicans are scrambling in Congress to make an already pro-Israel United States disposition even worse. We see it. But you no longer can come to us and say, see, At least we're not those guys. Mm. That's just not going to cut it anymore. And so when people say, well, you know, how are Muslims going to survive another uh, Trump administration? We survived him the first time. You're You're not threatening us with that. Oh, but democracy is at stake. I would say democracy has already failed if the only choices you're giving us are Donald Trump and Joe Biden. (laughs) Democracy is already done Mm. if that's what you're giving us. You know, choose your poison. We're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that there has to be a strategy in place. I think that that strategy um, will will come to full fruition as we get closer. There's still a lot that has to play out here. 
um, you know, do Muslims vote for a third party candidate this time? Um, Because ultimately America is hostage to uh, a pretty pathetic two party system. I think that's probably one of the greatest threats to the United States is that it rewards polarization. Um, I'm not as familiar with the British uh, system, but it rewards polarization. And so not that much different. <laughs> most people in the United States, it's interesting because like a, a serious political analysis of the United States, most people in the United States are voting for the lesser of the two evils in their mm-hmm. mind. Very few people in the middle are excited about anybody. It's usually about the lesser of the two evils. Mm-hmm. And so uh, both parties will then play to the extremes to try to push them over, right, to get that margin that's necessary and the dominant extreme or the one that's more rewarding politically. Um, I think that's a threat to America, right? So do Muslims vote for um, a third party candidate? Do we do, we do a national write-in campaign, um, you know, free Palestine or write in Wadir's name for president? Uh, rahimahullah. Still thinking about all that. Obviously, I don't make the decision, but I certainly, um, you know, plan on uh, being a part of coming up with the viable strategy. And obviously, the presidential election is just one election mm-hmm. of many. You know, right now there are a lot of primaries that are coming up, where you have a challenger, an unlikely challenger, in some places that you know, will definitely go one way or the other, Republican or Democrat, but it's at the primary level Mm. that you have a a good candidate, a more balanced candidate who might be looked at as an unlikely opponent. But if the Muslims galvanize and if people of conscience along with them galvanize, that unlikely candidate becomes the face of that party and that candidate wins the district Mm. because that party always wins the district. So we also can't wait till November to start thinking about this, right? Or just think about the president but I will not be voting for Joe Biden yeah. and I won't be voting for Donald Trump. Um, you know, I, I just, I don't think Muslims can do it. Mm. He has to know that he screwed up badly. And, you know, thankfully we are clustered in swing states. Uh, we have a presence and uh, hopefully no one will ever make the mistake that Joe Biden made again. Mm. I don't think anyone ever will again. And um, even at the, again, Congress level and other levels of government, that mistake will not be repeated ever again because we're going to show how strong of a community we really are. Mm-hmm. And what about the role of Muslim leaders, leaders in Muslim countries over the last couple of months? And Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about it? Well, I, uh, <laughs> I mean, I want to... Where do we start? Where do we start? But... I mean, I'm curious to hear what role you think someone in your position has in criticizing Muslim leaders. I don't just want to criticize. I think it's important for us to understand, sometimes as diaspora communities even, that we can put pressure um, that hopefully can undo some of the many wrongs that have been done, especially in these last few years. I hope some countries will walk back the Abraham Accords inshallah i hope that some of them will un- will will understand the great cost the moral cost if anything of um, normalization and the populations of those countries that can't stand it but that are terrified to say anything mm. you know, muslims from those countries that have normalized with israel will privately tell someone like myself like you know jazakallah khair thank you for saying this but you know we can't say anything mm. like our relatives back home are terrified to say anything about normalization, say anything about the Abraham Accords. And, you know, we can speak. Um, So I think that for those countries that have normalized with Israel, it's time for them to walk back that catastrophic decision and to cut economic ties with Israel, to hold it accountable, to rein it in. There's a BDS component to the individual. It's us not buying Starbucks. And it's them cutting uh, cutting their economic ties, mm. which is far more consequential. And obviously there's a divestment component at the academic institutional level and multiple places, right? But I think that we need to put pressure, exert pressure uh, from the outside where we can and also help some of those countries um, that have taken bolder stances and that are being threatened with the consequences. I know we when you say the Muslim world and you think of Muslim countries, uh, you you know, there are a few countries that come to mind usually. Um, but, you know, I have no problem um, acknowledging and in fact appreciating the stance of a country 
when it takes a step, right, that uh, will inherently lead to the great bully of the United States of America promising it all sorts of consequences. I was very proud of um, Prime Minister uh, Anwar Ibrahim, for example. That doesn't mean I agree with everything Dr. Anwar Ibrahim does or says in domestic or foreign policy of Malaysia, but I was very proud of him for taking a stance, right? Um, when any country, when any head of state takes a stance, it's important. But you also want to say that if you're symbolically paying heed mm. to the Palestinian cause, but your country has economic ties to Israel, yeah, you need to rethink that. And to be frank, um, I think it's about time that Muslim countries hold the United States accountable as well, the greatest party to this genocide. I would love for us to be able to collectively put enough pressure um, from the outside uh, as possible um, to encourage those countries to economically hold the United States accountable as well mm. uh, for this uh, for this incredible crime against humanity. It, it, now is the time. And we possess resources in the Muslim world. We possess a lot more power than we think so it's important for us to be able to use our tongue. It's important for us to be able to use our, our voices to condemn evil as we see it, but also to help say the things that people in those countries wish they could say, but they don't have the leeway to say. Finally, Dr. Omar, when uh, people come to you after your lectures, um, when you meet people, when you're traveling, even back home in Dallas, in your congregation, and they tell you that they're feeling frustrated. Yeah. Uh, they're feeling a sense of hopelessness, mm -hmm. a sense of exhaustion. What do you tell them? Um, some of those emotions are natural. And, you know, the people of Gaza are, interestingly enough, as much as their plight has been a source of great heartbreak, they've also been a great source of inspiration. If they can keep going, so can you. If they can keep fighting, so can you. If you're exhausted by seeing the images, they're exhausted by being in the images. You have a responsibility to keep on going. There's a difference between feeling helpless at times and feeling hopeless. We have to keep hope. We have to believe that there is light at the end of the tunnel. And I believe that fully, by the way. Um, we have to also draw inspiration from the lessons of the past, the lessons from the prophets and beyond of people that were far better than us and in a far worse situation where the tide of history changed by the permission of the same Lord who governs the universe today. So that's what I say to Muslims. You're talking to the same God and you're dealing with a situation that is objectively not as bad as some of the situations that you've seen in the past. And just as people in the past overcame, these people too will overcome. And we just hope that we're on the right side of that when it's all said and done. So keep it going. I get tired too. I feel broken at times. I feel like a piece of me has died. I feel like uh, uh, multiple times I just want to put it all down and cry. Um, shut down. But... At the end of the day, there's a privilege to that that I also recognize, that I have the ability to shut it off. Our people are literally starving. Over 90% of the people of Gaza are food insecure right now. That's madness, right? So it's like, I'm, I'm, I just, I can't afford to walk away from this, right? So this is a moment, we'll look back at this one day. Um, future generations will bear witness, and more importantly, you know, Allah himself will call us on the day of judgment and there will be witness to what we did in this moment. Here's the hopeful part of Islam always, that you are only accountable to your efforts, your intentions, what you try to do, not the outcome. It's your input, not your outcome that you'll be judged by. And that's all I care about at the end of the day. I know Allah has a plan for them and Allah has a plan for us. So what I'm worried about is when he asks me and when he asks us how about what we did. And I, I tell people this, subhanAllah, um, you know, as a Muslim, 
uh, the Gaza Strip in paradise must, m must be large. The Gaza Strip in paradise must be large. It must be a huge portion of paradise. I can't wait to visit the Gaza of Jannah, the Gaza of paradise, and meet these people that we've lost here that I'm sure are uh, in complete joy right now. But we'll, st we'll keep fighting for the ones that are still alive while knowing that the ones that have passed are actually still alive. We'll keep fighting for the ones that are still alive amongst us. Dr. Omar Salim, it's been an absolute pleasure. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you for being Thank with you. us today. I appreciate it. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you for watching this episode of The Big Picture and a big thank you to our guest for today, Dr. Omar Suleiman. We want to hear what you think about this discussion, about the ongoing war in Gaza, and about the role of both activism and religion in it. As always, you can watch or listen to all of our podcasts wherever you get your podcasts from. And until next time, salam.